Hey everybody, Ted Forbes here and welcome back to the Art of Photography. In this video, I wanna share with you guys the work of Tina Madotti. And Tina is a little bit more obscure of a photographer. It's not that she's not known at all, but she's kind of famous for doing several things. She started her career uh, as an actress in silent films and became somewhat known for that. And after becoming Edward Weston's mistress and moving to Mexico, there was a period of about nine years where she was very heavily involved in photography and did a considerable amount of work. And I think it's interesting because when when you look at notable photographers throughout the history of photography, her body of work is considerably less than most people uh, in terms of output. But I think the quality of her work is still very high. And I think she's really worth exploring. So today we're gonna to talk about Tina Madotti. So without further ado, let's go look at some work. Tina Modotti was born Assunta Adelaide Luigia Modotti Modini in 1896. At the age of 16, she moved from her native Italy to the United States with her father. Modotti soon developed an interest in performing arts and appeared in several plays, operas, and silent movies while living in San Francisco. Five years later, she moved to Los Angeles to pursue a career in film. Madotti became known for playing the femme fatale and in 1920 landed the starring role in the silent film The Tiger's Coat. Tina showed an interest in photography from an early age. Her uncle, Pietro Modotti, ran a photography studio in Italy, and later her father ran a similar studio in San Francisco. After moving to Los Angeles with her boyfriend, Robo Ricci, Tina soon became friends with Edward Weston. Weston became a mentor and inspiration for both Modotti's development as a fine art photographer, and by 1921, she was modeling for Weston, and the two soon began an affair. Madotti's boyfriend Robo went to Mexico in December of 1921. Unaware of Tina's affair with Weston, he took a portfolio of Weston's work, hoping to work out an exhibition in Mexico. While Tina was on her way to Mexico to join him, she found that he had died two days before her arrival of smallpox. The following year, Tina mounted a two-week exhibition of Robo and Weston's work at the National Academy of Fine Arts in Mexico City. Weston moved to Mexico the following year, leaving behind his wife and three of his four children. Tina set up and managed Edward's studio in return for his mentoring her as a photographer. Weston was taken by Mexican culture and was inspired by local folk art and landscape. Madotti, on the other hand, was more interested in people in the modernist aesthetic. She soon found a community of cultural and political avant-gardists who she became closely associated with, including Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera. As her photography skills began to mature, Modotti's work included lyrical images of peasants and workers and experiments with architectural interiors, flowers, and urban landscapes. Mexican photographer Manuel Alvarez Bravo notes two distinctions in Modotti's work being both romantic and revolutionary. The romantic aspects of her work undoubtedly influenced by Weston and the revolutionary from her growing interest in politics. In 1926, Weston signed a contract with writer Anita Brenner to photograph her book on Mexican folk art. Madotti and Weston were joined by Edward's son, Brett. The job was quite large, requiring over 400 8x10 negatives and prints. Brett was brought up to speed at a breakneck pace and learned how to make prints while traveling through Mexico in search of lesser-known native art. The project took months, and by the end, Edward's relationship with Tina was over. At the end of the project, Edward and Brett returned permanently to California. Modotti continued her works as a photographer, and in 1929 did her first one-woman retrospective exhibition at the National Library, which was advertised as the first revolutionary photographic exhibition in Mexico. By this time, Tina had been a member of the Mexican Communist Party for several years, and her work was very politically charged. In 1929, Modotti's close friend, Julio Antonio Mela, was assassinated, presumably by agents of the Cuban government. Soon there was an assassination attempt on Mexican President Pascual Ortiz Rubio, and Modotti was questioned about both crimes. In 1930, she was expelled from Mexico as the result of an anti-communist and anti-immigrant press campaign. Modotti evaded police through Rotterdam, Berlin, and Switzerland before making her way back to Italy to join the anti-fascist resistance before proceeding to Moscow in 1931. After this move to Russia, no photographs survive and it is presumed that Modotti never photographed again. During the rise of the Spanish Civil War, Modotti left Mexico for Spain. Following the collapse of the Republican movement, she returned to Mexico under a false identity. Two years later, Modotti died under somewhat suspicious circumstances, though the official autopsy indicated heart failure. She was 46. 
The interesting thing about Tino Adotti is that we're looking at um, an artist whose entire artistic output was pretty short and relative to other historically significant photographers. And we're talking about an output that lasted about nine years from 1921 to 1930 while during a period while she was living in Mexico. And the book that I'm using for this today is called Tino Madotti, Revolutionary Photographer. And it's on Ocean Press. I think I'll link it up in the show notes. I have kind of mixed feelings about this book. The essays are are, are fairly well written, um, but the book is pretty small. Again, we're dealing with an artist that doesn't have a lot of output. The printing is decent in here. I mean, it's an inexpensive book, so it's, you know, you're not going to be let down by that. But what drives me nuts about this book, and I'm going to show you as we go through, is that because Tina was in a lot of creative circles, uh, her relationship with Edward Weston, which we'll talk about, it, there are a lot of discredited works in here that uh, there is no photo credit on that are kind of implied that they're Tina's work and they're not. And I'll point those out as we go along. But what's interesting is is Tina, and, and this is the other thing, is when you start looking at Tina Madotti, you're entering Tina's world. And she had started her career in California, living with her dad. He had a failed photography business that lasted a little while but did not succeed. Um, she was very interested in the performing arts and she became uh, an actress in Los Angeles and starred in a very well-known silent film and was known as an actress and so therefore she was photographed quite a bit. Of course she was also Edward Weston's mistress, moved to Mexico with him. During that time of studying with Weston is where you see the bulk of her work and there are some moments in here that are exceptional and I think that's why she is historically significant and her involvement in politics and communism uh, probably doesn't have the same impact today but at that time it was extremely radical and really after she left Mexico there isn't any photography that exists that anybody knows of. So we're looking at a period of about nine years and, and I kind of want to go through this book and show you the cover image of this is gorgeous and there is a set of images in here which would begin with this one which is uh, one of my favorite portraits. This is a heavily cropped image with no photo credit. This is Johann Hegmeier and you know I've seen this miscredited as a self-portrait and it just simply is not and Tina was a wonderful photographer but Johann Hegmeier was a very different photographer, did these beautiful portraits. Tina was one of his subjects. And, I, you know, it's worth getting for the supplemental photos in here. I guess I'm just saying it frustrates me because they're either not credited or they're miscredited at times. And so that's a, a bit of a bummer. But I want to start out with a series here of still life images that Tina did. And the influence of Edward Weston uh, is quite obvious on these. Um, the soft light, um, the placement of the still life. And what's significant about these images though is what they are. And you know, you're looking at an Italian born woman who ended up in Mexico and she and Weston were both in different ways fascinated with Mexican culture. Um, they became friends in this circle of kind of bohemian artists that included Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo and Tina was very wrapped up in that culture and communism was a big political uh, passion of hers and it's interesting because if you look at what was going on in Latin America during the 1920s uh, in this somewhat rise of communism and these are obviously an ode to that and as I mentioned in the bio a minute ago there were kind of two sides to Tina's work the romantic and the revolutionary and these still lives combine both of those subjects because you obviously have the sickle you have the sombrero so the, the idea of the working class in here, which at the time was very threatening uh, to foreign interests, namely the United States. It was threatening to, uh, you know, the, the wealthy in Mexico and the Mexican government. And so this was, you know, very taboo to be working um, with this kind of subject matter. And at the same time, uh, she does it so beautifully. I mean, I think they, they have a different impact today because a lot of art has to deal with context. And this is context of Mexico in the 1920s. And so anyway, a series of still lifes that do this with the corn, you know, significant of the workers. I love this with the guitar and then, you know, the, um, the belt of, of ammunition. And uh, these are beautiful shots. The, the, you can see the impact that Weston had on her as a photographer, even though she did work that moved away from the stuff Weston did. Um, and she she did some pretty amazing portraits as well. Um, these are a few of these. Um, there's a little, this is where it starts to get confusing too because you know, this is kind of the, the circle of people she was running around with. We have Diego Rivera and uh, Frida Kahlo. And 
at the time, the Mexican muralist movement was going on, which Mexican artists such as Diego Rivera were doing these just beautiful murals uh, that were very lyrical in their depiction of scenery and people. And she was part of this circle. She didn't actually make murals herself, but she photographed quite a bit of them. Another miscredited photo, this is actually a Weston portrait and a very well-known one of Diego Rivera. Beautiful portrait, but sorry, it's just not Tina Madotti. I, I understand why this book is put together with these photos, because I think they're going after Tina as a person, as a cultural figure, but it, it, it's just frustrating to see things not labeled. And I don't know if they couldn't get the copyright and decided to print them anyway and didn't label them or what the problem was there, but I just think that's a little bit sloppy for a publisher to do that. And I'm sorry to call them out on this, but that is what it is. And if you don't know much about Tina's work, it's easy to go in there and assume you know, something's not labeled, that it is Tina's, and it's not. Uh, these are some of the murals that she photographed, um, you know, black and white at the time, and uh, she was kind of uh, dealt with a lot of document, uh, documentational photography as such as well. Um, this is hers. This is a really um, wonderful portrait of Diego Rivera with a cigar and the kitten on his shoulder. Of course, Diego was uh, quite a large man and uh, very strong personality as well. Um, some more still life images, and these calla lilies I have actually shown on the show before, a while back. I love these and I love the composition that's going on here that she uses the entire and this is a full bleed shot but it's close to what the crop is because she does use the entire um, frame of the image, the entire ground, and I love the way she's put just these lilies up at the very top edge of the image and the negative space that you see in the image is allowed to breathe and show through. A very mature shot. Again, there's not a lot of work that survives, and so it's interesting when you kind of look at these, particularly the botanical images, or something that you really like the feel of, to think what it could have been had Tina, you know, remained a photographer and stayed in Mexico or whatever. And you know, it's it's like you see an artist who had this enormous ability and talent with the camera but it stopped. And uh, anyway, another wonderful still life of this typewriter here. Uh, some more images. Um, we're going to get into the revolutionary side of Tina. And again, out of context, these images don't make a lot of sense. They appear to be street photographs of workers in Mexico. And in actuality, what they were was a promotion for the working class. She had jobs working for several uh, radical publications that were going around Mexico at the time. And a lot of these images were probably done for that. And so what we do see is kind of this personification and this kind of lyrical um, portrayal of the Mexican worker at that time. And some of these are great. I love this guy with all the stuff strapped to his back. Um, they're really neat, and I think they're very culturally significant. This is amazing, too. These are tamale shucks, and uh, I just think those are really great. They're just husks that are all bound together for making tamales. This is another well-known image of hers. Um, it's just called Hombre con Viga, which means man with a beam, uh, as the worker's moving that way. It's shot from the ground up to give kind of a prominence and importance to the figure being shot, which uh, you know is fairly conventional of work um, from that time in the 20s. Uh, this is another image that I think has that spark that makes you think, wow, what if she'd continued? And what we're seeing is obviously a very simple shot, an overhead view of this crowd, and they're all wearing the hats. And there is such a beauty that comes with this, um, the you know pattern of, of heads that are being shown here. But I think also what's interesting, too, is the cultural significance of this. Now, obviously, Tina was not of Mexican nationality, but being a part of that culture and having a, a, a legitimate interest in it, um, you do see that come through in the work. And this is one of my favorite shots. I absolutely adore this. Another one I want to show you here, and I'm going to point you to another source on this as well, because uh, this is an okay print, but um, there are several images, and I'll put a link in the show notes on this, that the Museum of Modern Art in New York owns, and you can see them on their website, and they're beautiful, and there's an, a different print of this that has a more sepia color to it that I think works a little better, but it's this woman with this jug, and, and I love the, the, the water lines that you see on it, and it's a, it's a neat image, and like I said, it's not that the book is poorly printed, it's okay. Okay, but there are some other resources as well. Um, the two that I can think of off the top of my head were uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York, so MoMA's website, and then also the Philadelphia Museum of Art has a pretty significant photography collection, and uh, they do have a couple of Tina's works as well. So I will link up to both of those in the show notes. Uh, this is a fairly well-known shot of hers as well with this woman, uh, you know, with the with the basket on her head. But anyway, it's an interesting book, and uh, of course, it's not an expensive book. And when you get to the end, they're trying to sell you more books. But, whatever. Anyway, it's probably worth owning uh, because it's inexpensive. 
And if you want to get a feel uh, for the overall work of Tina Madotti, I think this is a good place to start. I will try and track down the other book as well for maybe a future episode. Um, you know, she didn't do a lot of work, and we're dealing with a short time span where eventually the, um, the radical nature and some of the associations that she had, and not to mention uh, someone who was murdered in an assassination attempt on the president, led to a lot of questioning, and in a nutshell, she was expelled from Mexico, made her way back through Berlin, and eventually to Russia. Uh, and what's interesting is she came back to Mexico uh, probably about the time she was 40 and under a false identity and was died under suspicious circumstances is kind of how it's been left. Um, the official autopsy, quote unquote, said she died of heart failure, but being that she was in her 40s, um, I don't know. But anyway, really interesting figure. Um, and that's Tina Modotti. I want to take a second and give a shout out to our sponsor today, who are the awesome folks over at lynda.com. If you're not familiar with lynda.com, they have one of the most extensive online libraries of video training available anywhere. And come on over to the computer because I want to show you Lynda. Lynda is an amazing website, and for it's a monthly subscription, but you have access to the entire library. And as you can see, if you go under Browse the Library, they have pretty much every aspect of visual communications figured out here, including a lot of stuff on photography. If you go under photography, uh, they have software training, they've got course topics. For instance, I just pulled up portrait photography here, and as you can see, they've literally got thousands of videos on here. And they hit at every level, from beginner, intermediate, to advanced, and you can do an entire course on a subject, or you can just look for a video that you're interested in seeing. If you're interested in checking out lynda.com for yourself, I highly recommend you do so. And uh, they have an offer right now for Art of Photography viewers, where you can get seven days of unlimited access to the entire website. And what you want to do to get that is head over to this link that I'm going to give you, which is lynda.com slash AOP. That is lynda with a Y, lynda.com slash AOP. That's going to give you seven days of unlimited access to the entire website. And go check it out and see if this is right for you. I've used Lynda for years, long before they were ever a sponsor on the show. And I think you're really going to like it because I absolutely think the world of Lynda. So anyway, once again, that is lynda.com slash AOP. I want to give a special shout out and Thanks to the folks at lynda.com for once again sponsoring another episode of The Art of Photography. I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode. And for me, Tina Madotti represents a very interesting type of artist. If you consider that her output spanned about nine years of work and that she was extremely talented and extremely dedicated and driven during that time to produce on that high a level. Um, I mean, that's not completely uncommon because you do see this in other disciplines. If you take, you know, music for an example and you have Mozart who, you know, just had thousands of people pieces of work that were out there and just nonstop was composing and writing. And then compare that to somebody like Charles Ives who had a much more small catalog that was very select. You know, it, it, it's not uncommon, but I think what the uncommon part about Tina is that she achieved that efficiency during a very brief part of her life. Uh, she didn't live to be very old. Uh, she died, as I mentioned, under suspicious circumstances. It's a little sketchy on how she passed away, but a very interesting legacy. And the other reason I wanted to include her today uh, in the work that we're doing is that I know that I tend to pick photographers to feature on here to introduce you to that are either American or European and usually a little more mainstream, even when they are obscure, they kind of fit in with a certain style and aesthetic. And when I was researching Tina, I realized that Mexico and Latin culture is something that I really haven't picked up on a lot of. And so what I want to try to do in the weeks coming is pick artists from different cultures that aren't necessarily Europe and America. And I think Tina is a great introduction to that. Of course, she was European. She was born in Italy. Um, however, you know, it was her immersion in the Mexican culture during the 1920s, her associations with Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo um, that, you know, kind of opened my thoughts into it would be interesting to explore the real deal a little bit. So I hope that Tina is a little bit of a linchpin into that. Once again, guys, if you enjoyed this video, remember to like it and as always, share it with your friends. And remember to subscribe to The Art of Photography. I will send you more videos for free just for hitting that subscribe button. And once again, guys, this has been another episode of The Art of Photography. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Later.